Good morning, siblings in Christ. It's great to have you here for our Revised Common Lectionary Bible Study. Today we are looking at Sunday, April 3, which is the fifth Sunday in Lent, year C. And the introduction reads from Sundays and Seasons, God makes all things new. In the first reading, God promises it. In the gospel, Mary anticipates it, anointing Jesus' feet with cloths costly perfume in preparation for the day of his burial. In the second reading, Paul recalls his transformation from the persecutor Saul into an apostle. In baptism, God's new person, you, rises daily from the deadly mire of trespasses and sin. So we're going to kick it off today by looking at Isaiah Isaiah chapter 43. So dust off your Bibles and join Pastor Rebecca as she tells us a little bit more about this incredible passage that is filled with abundance and interesting pieces. So I'll pass it over to Pastor Rebecca. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jules. This is an astonishing chapter, but even more so, I discovered something that I think all of you know, but I managed to miss. When you study a chapter, all sorts of amazing things jump out. I've read Isaiah 43, 16 through 21, a number of times and pretty much have not noticed it until I got assigned it. If I thought of Isaiah 43 at all, I think of Isaiah 43, 1 through 7, mostly because you, Jules, pointed out to me at one point that the Lord says, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. And then it goes on and it takes people through the waters and a fire. And then there's Isaiah, the middle bit. And then there's a third bit. And I just kind of read through them. They never stuck until I got assigned to talk about them. And as I looked at Isaiah 43 more closely, you'll see that it's divided into four speeches. That first wonderful piece, God's salvation and help in a time of trouble. Second, the judgment, why God is really doing something by helping you. You don't really deserve it. Third piece, which is today's text, 16 through 21. Again, God's astonishing help in time of trouble and a new thing. And then the last speech, again, judgment, but God loves us so much. God will even overcome the judgment. And as I started to pay attention, to 43, 16 through 21, it does two things. It looks back at God's mighty acts and then tells you not to get stuck there, to look forward because something new is coming. It looks back to creation. It looks back to the Exodus. It looks back to the first part of Isaiah, certainly at least 150 years earlier than this particular text was written. And it encourages us to look for something new. Isaiah 43, 16 through 21. Thus says the Lord, who makes the way through the sea a path in the mighty waters, who brings the chariot and the horse, the army and the warrior. They lie down and cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old, for I am about to do a new thing. And now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, that the wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I form for myself, so that they might declare my praise. Wow. Did you go back to creation? God's control over the mighty waters only the Lord God who spoke creation into existence and formed the firmament to protect the people from the waters. Only God can do that. And the exodus, the chariots, the horses, the warriors, and that reflects back to that firmest promise speech in the opening of Isaiah 43. And then Israel, out of slavery in Egypt, God brought them out with a mighty arm and a strong hand. And from the exodus on, 
That's how the people of Israel will identify themselves as people of the God who freed them from slavery and brought them out with a mighty arm and an outstretched hand. All of these glorious deeds. And then we're not supposed to stay there. We're supposed to look ahead. Something new is coming. So new that even the jackals and the ostriches will praise God. In the first part of Isaiah, before the exiles, the jackals and the ostriches were signs of chaos, of disorder, of turning away from God. In the second part, after the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the devastation, the faithlessness of the Egyptians, the jackals and the ostriches will praise God. Something very new has happened. And oh, by the way, though all the good stuff has been mentioned, and you've got chaos turned into triumph and praise, don't get stuck there because God is bringing something new. The Lord God is doing a new thing, even when we don't understand. And it's so good and it's so grand that all God's people will call out God's praise, even as in Psalm 26 and certainly as suggested in the gospel. God's power is throughout the world from creation onward. And oh, by the way, even in the midst of this devastated people who have known suffering, have almost no land to farm, who are a little bit hopeless, don't get stuck there. God's bringing something new and we are all part of it. And we all get to sing God's praise. I like this. Thanks be to God. I like that it, it actually talks about uh, ostriches. Oh yeah. In Genesis, I uh, know, Isaiah 2, there are signs of devastation, destruction, and the people turning away from God. Here, there are signs of God's doing something new. Nice. I, I'm really digging this whole Lent that is about new creation kind of stuff. It's been very good. And I, I have really enjoyed, and thank you, Pastor Tanner, for finding the, uh, the resource that we've been using for Lent. That's just been, you are here. I love that. God is here. We're not alone. Thank you, Pastor Rebecca. I'll kick it over to Victor Michael now, who's looking at Psalm 126. That is correct. And thank you very much. Uh, good morning, saints and siblings. Great to be with you. Uh, Psalm 126. Uh, I will just get into the, the little intro and then the reading of it for you. So uh, if you have that handy, uh, if not, you can turn to it quickly. The intro reads, those who sowed with tears will reap with songs of joy. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then were we like those who dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we are glad indeed. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the watercourses of the Negev. Those who sowed with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, will come again with joy, shouldering their sheaves. In this psalm, I identify almost immediately with my word of the year, laughter, and, right. and trying to be uh, a little more happy about everything. And when I read this psalm, the psalm of ascent, we have, and Pastor Rebecca pointed out, there's a lot of similarities, even with Isaiah, is this kind of, we have what has happened in the past, we have what's happening in the present, but we also have this future look. And in reading this, it's this idea of, for me, the fortunes of Zion being restored. So there's, depending, I'm looking at uh, a wonderful piece from a working preacher by J. McClinton McCann Jr. And he suggests that in the translations that perhaps this has happened or it's still yet to happen, but we have this future idea, this goodness that is always going to be there. And those who dream, I think we can all identify with dream, uh, the famous I have a dream speech of bringing us together and looking forward and having that 
I think of being a time of being so thirsty or something, but then suddenly our mouth is filled with laughter. Our tongue with shouts of joy. You know, it's very real. It's very embodied spirit working here. And not only do the people recognize this, but the other nations, everyone has a glimpse of this, that the Lord has done great things. And it's for them, but this for them also then entails for all of us. And that is where the Lord has done those things. I also like to point out in this short little six verses we're given here of how much we have to thank for the Lord for that. And that's where we pick up even from the Isaiah reading of the waters and the life-giving waters we have, and then restore our fortunes, O Lord, from verse four, like the water courses of the Negev and that desert, those, and I, I don't know the elevation of those, but I would assume mountains, perhaps they would have snow occasionally, but those rains that would fall upon the mountains, work their way down and suddenly turn the super dry desert into this place of life, place of growing. And with that, we have, it's interesting, those who sowed with tears. So we're thinking our own tears, this real human piece here, but the happiness then that results, and that's how they go, returning with their sheaves, meaning that for things to grow, you need a certain amount of time. And settling down and having crops and celebrating the harvest happens once you have a place, once you have a home. So that is this joy that they have, that they're able to grow these crops, reap from those crops, but still remembering that this came through a fair amount of work, sorrow, but it's the Lord that's been with them the whole time. And that's why I like to think, again, that this is an interactive, ongoing piece if this has restored the fortunes of Zion, it has happened this one time, or are we still looking to the future? And I think it is both and here that we have this wonderful history and this psalm that really frames this joy and happiness of what God has done for us. And especially when we think of, for me, spring, uh, again, I, I still peek at the little plants we planted with the confirmation group. And it looks like we're doing pretty well with a lot of little sprouts coming up. And uh, as, as much as we get excited about spring, we get excited about what the Lord has done. We then have these periods like where the weather's cooled off all of a sudden. So it kind of tempers what uh, we're doing, only to be expectant again for this warm weather. So I encourage you to look at the psalm. It comes with this group of psalms. And uh, it, it is one of those where I read it carefully uh, and I think about that, but then also knowing the joy that comes as a result of having this great gift is the joy that I hope you all experience uh, when reading and studying. That is where I will end. <laughs> Thanks. Rebecca, do you want to add anything about the wadi? Um, wadi are the winter rains that carve incredibly monumental caverns in the desert. You can tell where they've been. They tend to dry up in the summer and the winter rains ferocious torrents. I mean, you cannot get caught in one. If you do, you die. Um, the main route between uh, Jerusalem and Jericho is the Wadi Kilt and it's been used for centuries as a passage. But I'm not sure what you want me to say about them. They're certainly significant and you can see them, the results of. Well, you're the water person, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I the wadi don't, don't invite me into that because i can go on i've, I've got the i know you know we have a time limit set i on know you. um <laughs> in the resource that pastor tanner gave us that i mentioned before they talk about the wadi is in the negev do you say negev, that? negev <laughs> desert mm -hmm. south of the hills of judah the landscape is dry brown rocky between some of the hills you can see these paths, but nothing flows them. And then all of a sudden there's water. So there's like mm -hmm. a, a link oh, to yeah. the Negev River's rebirth caught on film in the times of Israel. Uh, this was captured back in 2014, but mm -hmm. if you want to look it up, it's uh, Lazar Berman. And you, you could just put Negev River's rebirth <laughs> into your Google search thing. And it'll be like a bunch of people hanging out and then 
it looks like nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. And then it's just like mini ha ha falls. <laughs> oh yeah. It's just really, really They're cool. ferocious. Or Vermilion Falls for that matter. Mm -hmm. All right, we're gonna kick it over to Paul, uh, Philippians 3, and that's Pastor yeah. Tanner. Yeah, Philippians chapter three, and our reading for this Sunday uh, is uh, three, four B through 14, um, but I'm gonna start at verse two um, because that's where, the, that's where the story actually starts. And, um, and he addresses it, and so I wanna, I want to. I want to have it all. So, um, Philippians chapter three, starting at verse two, Paul writes: Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of those who mutilate the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, who worship in the spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh, even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as lost because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining toward what lies ahead, I press on forward toward the goal of the prize of the heavenly call of God, Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, so... I, I wanted to add that those first two and a quarter verses because Paul's response, Paul's first paragraph is in response to that first chunk there. Um, and it is yet another reminder in, especially in this Lenten season uh, about the dangers of anti-Semitism in our texts. All right, I feel like I've been talking about this a lot. So you should Thank know you. the spiel, but like, this is the thing, right? Um, Without the context of what we're talking about, it's very easy to look at this text and see Paul is saying, I used to be Jewish, um, but now I am not. And those Jews over there are the dogs, and, and they should be ignored. And you need to press on as Christians and people of Christ and do your own thing, and those folks are just backwards. Um, but that is not what he's saying. And that is never what he says. And we need to be reminded of that because we have a long history of assuming that's what he says and putting those words in his mouth, right? Paul is very, very clear in this text to the Philippians who are writing to him saying, hey, don't we maybe need to like follow all of the rules that come to us from the Hebrew scriptures? Um, and Paul is saying, no, no, not necessarily. You, you, don't, you don't have to, in this particular case, be circumcised and become Jewish and welcomed into that faith to then become Christian, right? He's saying that, that some of those things are, are not part of this tradition that we have, but you can follow those things if you want to. There's just not a requirement there. And at the end of the day, you need to stop being so mean to each other about these things and setting more and more barriers and requirements on one another and just, just live your life of faith. And then he jumps into our text for today, which is, that was me. I am a Hebrew born of Hebrews. I uh, am uh, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, as the law of Pharisee, as the zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law of blameless. I am these things. And I am saying to you, as someone who has all of this lineage of background, that it's silly for us to depend on those things. If, if it, that, that's not what this is about. This is about something completely different. So stop putting things on one another. And instead, 
as Pastor Jules often tells us, keep your eye on your own bobber and worry about your life and faith in the here and now and not in the in the history of tradition, right? Um, so he goes on to talk about how those things that are about who he is in terms of that, that lineage of identifiers, he calls them rubbish, um, which is a, in other versions of this sewage um, and really translates as poop um, or a particularly colorful word that is much like poop um, that you wouldn't think is in the Bible, but it's there in the Greek. Um, but I won't use it because I don't want to put a quarter in the swear jar on the altar today. Um, he says that those things are those things are not important, right? Um, but that we are to to move forward in our lives of faith together. And for Paul, this life of faith as as Christians is not a one and done sort of thing, right? Because not only is he looking at at the people in his in the crowd who are Jewish, but he's also looking at the people in the crowd who aren't Jewish but who identify as Christian within this community. And he's saying, you too don't get to rest on your laurels, right? This, that's not what this life of faith is about. It's this idea that we have um, that, that took over Christianity for a long term, a long time, which is that the baptism is some sort of fire insurance, right? Like get baptized mm. and then you're saved, right? Like that's it. That's one and done and you're fine and it's great and wonderful. And no matter what, that's it. And then you can just rest and not do anything for the rest of your life. Um, that's that's Paul. Paul says, no. No, it's, it's not about who you are. It's not about your background. It's not about your baptism. Uh, it's not about what you say. It's about what you do. My talk talks, my walk talks, my walk talks louder than my talk talks, right? This, this idea that faith involves running and wrestling and striving and fighting all your life through um, to continue this life of faith. Um, it's not about sitting on your laurels. It's, it's about working and and going out and making sure that that there are others who get to be a part of this as well and that there's justice um, in the world around us and the nrsv which is the version that we use in worship is usually in my opinion a really good translation of the bible um, but it makes a lot of paul's writings in philippians more passive um, and he's he's really being active here right so in verse 12 we have not that I have obtained this already or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own, which is really lovely. But what the, what the Greek really says is that Jesus has reached out and grabbed hold of me, right? Like there is, there is action here. Jesus has reached out and grabbed hold of me so that um, we can get shaken up and go and do things, right? And not just sit back and wait for things to get better. Um, and I think that the correlation... For me personally, is to to uh, Paul's lineage, right? Is that I too was I was born a uh, straight white American male Christian, right? There's a lot of privilege laid out in that particular list of lineage, right there. Um, I come from a middle class family. I come from a land owning family. Um, that there, there's a lot of privilege wrapped into that reality, right? Now, is it possible for me to give up those emblems of privilege? No, those exist, right? They exist in the world. They are here. This is who I am. That, that's, that's a reality. But what I can do, what we can do, is that we can give up our comfort with them. We can give up our blind allegiance to the status quo. We can uh, give up complacency about the plight of others, right? And that's what, that's what Paul is saying in this text, right? It doesn't matter who you are, what your background is. This call to faith is a call to action. It's a call to, 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 to live, to show up, do good, be kind, right? To, to go into the world and to do these things um, in, in companionship with the people around you, not in competition with them. And, and he really, really, really just wants us to work for this heavenly prize that is Jesus Christ, right? Not, not because we need to work for it to get to heaven, but because we cannot help but. Because we have been saved by Jesus Christ, by the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we cannot help but be moved by the Spirit into the world um, to do these things um, and to, to make the world, just quite frankly, a better place. So that's where I want to rest it today. Thank you. I, I just so appreciate you lifting up some of the potentially difficult verses and clarifying. Thank you so much.
you yeah um vicar michael and i were talking about how those of us who have evangelicals in our family this seems to be the great divide, <laughs> you know? Like you have to do X, Y, and Z in order to get into heaven and you have to behave a certain way, otherwise you're not gonna be admitted. And and how that can like create division within our families today. I mean, it's sort of like a weird echo, even though it's still, you know, the Christian faith. I like, um, see if you can uh, allow me to screen share real quick. Yeah a quick image that isn't going to be like taken away. Can you do that, Michael? I got it. Okay. There we go. So I ran across this in my inbox yesterday. Oh, wow. <laughs> that is like so simple and straightforward. Uh -huh. <laughs> If you have a sentence that has the word, but after God loves you, you're probably <laughs> doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, enough of that. Um, I have the beautiful section of scripture. It's from the gospel according to St. John. And it starts at chapter 12. So if you wanna open up your Bibles to chapter 12 in St. John, Here's the preface from Sundays and Seasons. Judas willfully misinterprets as waste Mary's extravagant act of anointing Jesus' feet with costly perfume. Jesus recognizes that her lavish gift is both an expression of love and an anticipation of his burial. The text reads, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and then money given to the poor? In parentheses, it reads, he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. At least I think that's where it is. Yep. It just ended weird on my page here, so I, I just needed to edit that. Okay, um, I have like a whole bunch of things, and I, I wish we had like, many, many hours to talk about this, but I will throw out to those who have ears and will listen, a wonderful um, author. Her name is Cynthia Bourgeau, <laughs> B-O-U-R-G-E-A-U-L-T, Cynthia Bourgeau. She has written a whole bunch of books um, about the mystics, about uh, women in the Bible, she has written a book called the meeting the meaning of mary magdalene and it is I, i've read it twice now and i get something new out of it each time um it is it's just a great book uh she is also a writer for the center for action and contemplation and one of the things that that i thought was really interesting um and this was this was written, let's see, back in 2019. It's about anointed and anointing. So this is Cynthia Bourgeau. While the anointing at Bethany taken in isolation may strike the modern reader as an exceptional and even an exotic event, ritual anointing figured prominently in Jesus's work. In the healings of both the deaf man in Mark 7, 33, and the blind man in John 9, 6, he is depicted as performing this anointing using his own spittle. It, if scripture tradition remembers correctly that Mary Magdalene received a healing at his hands, it is likely that anointing figured in this as well. 
In fact, claims the historian Bruce Chilton, Jesus may have actually learned the art of ritual anointing from Mary Magdalene. Chilton speculates that her struggles with demons may have brought her into the healing and uh, I don't know how to say this, shamanic, does that sound right? Sure. Shamanic circles for which her re region of Galilee was well known. Anointing may have been a core piece of the healing arts with which she was gifted. Uh, Jesus, for his increasing divergence from the Nazarite path, to which he was originally consecrated. So I think that's just like, isn't that interesting? <laughs> Maybe Jesus learned how to do anointings from Mary Magdalene. And then we have this beautiful ending of her anointing Jesus. Now, the thing that strikes me about this piece is Lazarus, the one whom Jesus raised from the dead. Now, he was in the grave for how long? Four days. Four days. And there was a great stink. Should be. Yes. So my question is, is there residual death being smelled in the space as the food is prepared and as Mary goes over mm. and places this incredibly fragrant mix upon Jesus to anoint him as king before the king of the Jews is placed over his head? It's a real uh, sensory kind of idea of did Lazarus still smell like death and is what Mary did that which covered up death so that new life could be smelled by all in preparation now I don't know I'm just throwing that out I think it's an interesting idea I see Rebecca's uh yeah uh, can I be a heck that. of a lot more prosaic there were donkeys on the road and they walked in sandals and sometimes barefoot. And she washed his feet, which is having walked some of those roads and smelled some of the smells. Um, I would be far more prosaic, Jules. It's, it's an interesting take, but I would go back to the feet and what it actually smelled like. Yeah. Well, it's a Bible study, so we're just like throwing it out there for people to think so. <laughs> none of us can answer it, but. No, none of us can answer it. Um, in the meaning of Mary Magdalene, there is a quote by Cynthia Bourgeau. The risen Lord is indeed risen, present, intimate, creative, closer than your own heartbeat, accessed through your vulnerability, your capacity for intimacy. The imaginal realm is near and through it, you will never be separated from anyone or anything you have ever loved for love is the ground in which you live and move and have your being. This is the message that Mary Magdalene has perennially to bring. This is the message we most need to hear. The love that she extended to Jesus is so lavish. It's so powerful. It's, it's a, uh, I pair it with the, the, prodigal son's father rushing out towards chasing after just this lavish amount of grace love so i'm not exactly sure what i'm going to do uh this coming sunday but it'll be fun and there I might be i'm just saying there might be a, a, a baby by then we don't know yet be lovely don't know yet don't know yet. Anything else from the good of the community? Our new announcements? Um, yeah, I might circle back on one other thing. There's, uh, there's one other quote that I ran into that I thought was interesting. Oh, one yeah. Meal, one meal, Pastor Jules. Yeah, meal. I know. <laughs> Women's Bible Commentary. The anointing is an act of pure extravagance underscored by the, by the comment that the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Mary has anointed Jesus so lavishly that all present can participate in it. That was the other line that I really liked. Just that, that over, it's sort of like, 
y'all when when we were in pandemic mode and i would come into the church and i'd stand in the back of the sanctuary and i couldn't see the altar because there was so much incense blowing because pastor tanner had gotten new incense and he was trying it out i mean that's kind of there's an image for you you're fine you're all right <laughs> announcements <laughs> uh just a reminder that we are coming up pretty rapidly on Holy Week, which is very exciting. Um, so Palm Sunday worship on the uh, at nine o'clock, regular time. And then we've got no worship that Wednesday of Holy Week, but yes, worship on Thursday and Friday. And those will be at seven o'clock, not 646, but at seven o'clock. You come at 646, that's totally fine. You just <laughs> um, be early and that's totally fine. Uh, and then worship on Easter Sunday at nine, and 10 30 and 30 9 and 10 30 so come and hang out for that and don't forget to take your flowers home with you after worship <laughs> on easter please that would be yeah. super super helpful and we would really enjoy that and there's uh so we're not setting a precedent we're not going back to two services we're just doing this for easter and it will be indoors we still want you to mask up Perhaps the week after Easter, we may pull that mandate off and those who need to can, and there's not going to be any weirdness around that. But if any of you people love plants that are, are participating in this Bible study, and you would like to make sure that the plants are being watered uh, when they arrive, between when they arrive and when they go back to your home, just uh, either show up and do it, because that's often how things get done around All Saints, or let one of us know that you're going to be popping in to make sure that the lilies and mums and whatever. What are those tiny little? Other flowers as, as here. So, so yeah. And then um, don't forget also that this coming Wednesday, we are still collecting items for our friends at uh, Casa Guadalupana and Jonathan House. Uh, mostly paper products, cleaning supplies. That information is in your newsletter. So take a look at that, please. That would be read your awesome. newsletter. It is chocked full of all sorts of things that will be coming up. Yeah, coming your way. All right. Hey, thanks to everyone for being with us for this time. It was great to see you all. And uh, if you need anything, let us know. We are around and uh, take care. Blessings.